Thank you so much, Theo. I will take just uh, think one second because I want to give time to our speakers. Um, so welcome to our fourth session, and I'm very happy to chair this this session because we have like three uh, interesting papers. I could say like a three. Uh, anthropological papers that look like uh, based on strong ethnographic research and very interesting theoretical assumptions so i am really um, i'm really waiting to hear from from them so the first speaker is our robert mcdowell which uh, who is going to talk about the deities and perspectivism in the traditional indic knowledge practice so robert when you are ready you can just start. Okay, thank you. I'll share my screen. Um, yeah, so uh, I'm from Australia, so usually it's customary for us to, because um, we're a settler colonial nation, to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land. Um, so I like to acknowledge the Bunrung people of the Eastern Kulin Nation, whose lands and waters I live and work on, and want to acknowledge that sovereignty was never ceded and uh, pay respects to elders past, present and emerging. I'd also like to pay respect and acknowledgement to any South Asian people watching, any Indian people, and um, want to uh, show my respect and gratitude to wonderful South Asian culture, of which I'm a, a, a very grateful student. <laughs> And I'd also like to thank you to Theodora and to Daniela, especially, whose work I'm really uh, hugely am, uh, admiring of. So I'm really happy to be here and to be doing this. Anyway, thank you. Um, yeah, so my talk is basically uh, starts off uh, sort of reflecting on years now of, um, of sort of immersion and ethnographic research in India uh, with the basically with a very broad sense of kind of uh, speculative uh, conceptualization and asking a series of questions about the Indian tradition in general. Nothing about yoga specifically, nothing about any uh, particular aspect of uh, classical Indian knowledge particularly, but more the general, the broader sense of the whole gamut. So these questions are, what is Hinduism? What is Darshan? What is Sadhana? And what are deities? Very, very broad, but we'll go into it. <laughs> um, I started off by trying to think about uh, the ways in which uh, in the uh, Indian tradition has been represented in our scholarship. So the Indolog Indological traditions. And the first we could think of as philology and history, which is you know the study of language and the study of history. And the main methodology of that, as we know, is, is studying and researching historical texts. Um, then you have uh, sort of quantitative sociology, which is like studying populations and usually in a very dry manner, as we know of sociologists. <laughs> and um, then there's this idea of qualitative sociology and anthropology, which is making, you know, broad uh, interviews with the laity, with lay people, with Hindu people, you know, with Jain people, Buddhist people. Um, yeah, and trying to and drawing collisions. Most of the anthropological literature is based upon this, you know. Um, but I'm sort of realized very early on that I was more interested in a kind of qualitative anthropology of uh, interviewing religious experts um, to try and hear it from the horse's mouth, as we say, <laughs> to try and understand uh, what they say about what their tradition, and particularly I'm talking about what we can call Hinduism here, of course. Um, what it is and what it means and what it represents. So generally the two religious experts that we can think about are the pundits and the sadhus. And I'm going to go into a bit more detail later about what I think are the distinctions between those two. But I sort of was very aware early on that I was interested in the sadhus because they were the guys and the women as well who are out there living and experiencing and embodying this tradition and that's what i was interested in and uh, just some considerations here i've written too much so i'll have to go through it pretty quickly um i've never been interested in yoga specifically but religiosity via aestheticism um i've never been to the kumbh Mela. i've been going to india for 12 years now but um i found that, that i was less interested in sort of the 
general sociality of sadhu life, which Danielle's work has, is, I think, some of the best, greatest uh, qualitative anthropological information about sadhus. Jim Mountains as well. It's, you know, it's a huge honor for me to be involved with you guys. Um, but I was more interested in spending time with a singular character, you know, and, and who I, someone who I thought was an authentic pra practitioner. And um, something that Clifford Yates would refer to as deep hanging out, you know, some a deep sort of sense of qualitative knowledge gather gathering, you know. Um, secondly, like, uh, because I ended up basically becoming initiated uh, into sadhu life. Um, you know, it's important here in any intellectual work that I do not to reveal sort of what would be privileged information, you know, that would be seem to be unethical. But so what I've really done is that everything I've, I've talking about is already available in popular literature, basically, and scholarly literature. But um, spending time with uh, my informant, who I'll explain uh, soon, was, was the way in which I learn to make sense of all of the information and the, the literature which I am continually read. And um, just generally I'm interested broadly in representation as I'll explain like um, and how it is that the Indian tradition can be has been represented and can be understood from my own context in you know English language Western modernity. Um, notes some positionality. I'm a, obviously I'm a white Western Angadesi. I'm a I'm a white Western man. I have systemic privilege. I have money. I have mobility. I have I'm a perpetual outsider. Um, I've benefited from the colonization of India. You know that's a very broad, honest statement. And I have a moral and ethical responsibility to think critically and in a decolonial way about Indian culture, people, and thought, and the way it's represented by my own colonizing Western culture. And it's also my ethical responsibility to think critically about oppression in India and support progressive politics and social justice uh, wherever and whenever possible. And it's uh, my ethical responsibility to think with Indian thought rather than about Indian thought, which is something I'll explain uh, soon. And it's a moreover responsibility to have respect because of course the uh, ethics of ethnography can really be boiled down to that singular word. So. <laughs> Uh, the terms I used, uh, maybe so, but in, I use the term Indic because it relates to the whole of the South Asian continent. Um, it's a little provocative title, but you know, it is uh, for various reasons. But And also the idea of a knowledge practice, um, the idea of a, a practice being an, a, a kind of plural. It could suggest a practice, could, su could suggest a series of uh, a, a whole range, an assemblage of kind of dissenting um, practices. So I don't particularly mean Advaita Vedanta, which is what I spent time with. I mean the whole thing in general, you know. So, and there's a quote of uh, Eduardo Vivera Sacastro, who I'll introduce later, that the peoples of the world live through practice, in practice, and for practice. Any plausible anthropological theory must begin with this principle. All anthropological theory must be must be a theory of practice. This is some uh, now controversial information I'll go into. The idea about representation and what inspired me to, and what I think about when writing about it is representation question again. And um, the thing that's a uh, big thing that's happened in scholarship in the last 10, 20 years has been this kind of debate um, about the representation of Hinduism, particularly between Wendy Diger and Rajiv Malhotra. Um, idea that Malhotra is a non-resident Indian, uh, you know, who who sort of has believes that all Western sort of accounts of Hinduism are false, and and um, and uh, uh, he calls them sort of neo-colonial, and there's this sort of to and fro. And um, Donica kind of asserts that that's you know that this is that uh, and Malhotra is a, he's a proponent of of sort of far right uh, Hindu nationalist thinking, so. Um, you know, this is strange. And Doniger herself is an amazing like, sociological and anthropological uh, scholar. But her thinking um, oftentimes is representational because it, it brings a, a sort of a, just a, a broad sort of representational historical terms to the tradition. So that's something that I was more concerned with kind of going beyond, I'd say. And um, 
the Nay Science by Lurie and Bhagachi, 2014, is a really interesting text, and that's the idea of like taking Indian thought seriously, and um, uh, uh, and thinking about the history of Western Indology as as not really being willing to to think with th the concepts of Indian philosophy. You know, so it's kind of I'm inspired by this and how it's important to like push back against sort of hegemonic thinking and, and think with Indian thought in order to free it from a kind of, from this kind of, um, yeah, I guess, oppressive kind of uh, uh, politics. And uh, again, just the idea of anthropology, the task of making the familiar strange and the strange familiar. <laughs> yeah. And again, this idea of uh, anthropology as a quality of research, um, I sort of, my methodology has been, to sort of move beyond um, purely participant observation, which I consider to be a kind of uh, epistemological participation and move towards what I call a kind of ontological participation, which I'll explain a little bit more. And um, basically the idea of seeking qualitative data in the form of, uh, in the form, uh, seeking quality data can't, you know, when you, participant observation, when you're dealing with something like the Indian tradition and particularly aestheticism, it's something that can't really be purely, it can't really be observed because it can only really be experienced. So I kind of decided that in order to really understand this tradition, I was going to have to experience it myself. And that led me on the path which I've been on for the, all these years. And uh, people would sometimes ask, him, ask me, are you worried that in being sort of initiated that you will lose your subjectivity? And my response was that I want to lose my, or lose your, your, sorry, lose your objectivity is what I meant. And I would answer, no, I want to lose, I want to lose my objectivity. And I, because only by surrendering to a complete sense of the subjective, does a, a newer kind of objective understanding emerge, um, especially when dealing with something like aesthetic practices. And um, the fact that we're human makes it a kind of a universal. So only by really experiencing it was that I, um, that I figured that I was going to be able to really understand. Um, now, moving on to my informant, um, his name Omgiri Maharaj of Kangra, Kangra just district in Himachal Pradesh. Um, he's a rural Pahari Brahmin of um, Goswami caste. And um, he was a student of uh, the uh, Tamil Dasnami Dus Nagasanyasi Naga Sanyasi named Triveni Bhadi Maharaj uh, in the 1970s and 80s. And he was, um, uh, comes from Guri, uh, Giri Puri Bhati sub-branch of the Dasnami order. And um, he's what I like to call a strategic brahmacharya because he was born um, as a Gos as a Gosain or Goswami by birth, by caste, which means that Traditionally, he was allowed as a as Goswamis were allowed as Dasnami sadhus to have relationships and to have children and to be grahastas, to be householders. So as a result, he uh, was in a relationship and had uh, fathered two children before taking sannyas and and disappearing into the mountains once more, <laughs> which is where I met him. And he has traveled overseas and he's been around Western people and around Western ways of thinking, but he's still very rural, uh, Pahari, which means a mountain uh, man. And speaks basic into intermediate uh, English and was able to instruct me using basic to intermediate English and Hindi over all these years. And uh, as well as being a sadhu, he's also what you'd call a, a tantric, which means uh, someone that uh, performs so psychotherapeutic healing for the local population. And that comes in the form of, of um, astrological Havan Puja, which is a fire ceremony, and using the Vidyas, which are the uh, uh, deities for, for intervention into people's lives for, for psychotherapeutic healing. And uh, he's also, he's uh, what he considers to be an, an Vaitan, which is uh, the nature of the Dasnami Sampradaya, is uh, was, uh, from Adi Shankaracharya's Advaita Vedanta. Um, when I asked him about Advaita, he, he responded that um, he's, he knows it as, which is the traditional understanding of Advaita is Advaitwad, which means to speak Advaita. So the idea of Advaita Vedanta is this scholarly thing, but on the ground, it's, it's considered, it's Advaita, a different term. Um, he's an interesting man. He shuns the sort of orange kasari and bagua cloth that's mostly the symbol of wandering sadhus, and he considers them to be 
kind of symbols of Boy Scoutism and Chauvinism, uh, which he kind of seems to, he shuns. And uh, mostly his methodology, his upaya, is in temple pilgrimage in uh, Puja, in, in Havan Puja, using geotisha, astrological protocols, and primarily mantra sadhana, which we will talk about now. And he thinks, uh, it's a couple of interesting points, he thinks that postural yoga is, is not sadhana, which is a huge area of conversation that we can talk about later, maybe in Q&A or so forth, if anyone's interested. Hmm. So um, basically, to, to describe sadhana, I think I'll just remind people of the Ashtanga system of Patanjali, these eight things, yama, niyama, asana, pranayama, pratyahara, dharana, dhyana, samadhi. And although sadhana is not necessarily yoga, you can see these eight steps in nature of sadhana, so as we'll see. And um, this is where sort of ethnographic uh, information really begins to describe what sadhana is. Um, sadhana is basically the main method of sadhus everywhere. Um, it's a bit of a mistake to consider the methodology to be any like postural practice or anything like that. Really, the, the sadhus mainly their, their, their primary concern is in mantra sadhana um, with some contestation, but that's a, a different conversation. But a sadhana is uh, basically is a meditational thing. Um, and it begins by having a calm, centered and relaxed and seated stable position, which in the Yoga Sutras you say it could be like Yama, Niyama and Asana. Then it this then moves on to an initiating prayer with hands clasped in Anjali Mudra. Always first a, a, a prayer or a mantra to Ganesh and then to Guru and then to a spectrum of deities. And after this initial uh, mantra has been performed, that's when japa begins, which is the quiet mental repetition of mantras using the mala rosary, which is uh, uh, beads of rudraksh or, or sandalwood or the uh, tulsi wood tree. And um, um, japa's forms will... Sorry? You're just over 15 minutes, just to give you a time check. Okay. Um, <laughs> uh, yeah, so that's uh, so uh, sadhana is uh, performed while whilst uh, focusing on the yantra, which is the, the body, like a vehicle, and um, and uh, this ha occurs until the absorption in the mantra in the object of fo a focus, um, and this results in what I would refer to as an expansion of awareness and an enhanced physiological sensitivity and a dissolving of identification subsequent sense of vibratory synergy and emerging with the vidya in question, the vidya being the deity in question. And this results in a profound psychological change by the incineration and liberation of psychological limitations. And I guess I've gone over time. I was about to go into a bunch of information about what I really think about that, but we've run out of time, so yeah. But um, if that's it, I guess, well, is that, uh, I have to stop now? Or? You you can you can go to more like twenty, but I, I just wanted it, it, it felt like you might go on rather longer than that. I wanted to just let you know we are a little okay, tight yeah. for time, <laughs> so you know take another couple of minutes. But um, any more than that, okay. we'll be taking time from other people. Okay, sure, sure. Um, I guess yeah, there's plenty more to say here, but I guess the main point is that to try and think about like what uh, sadhana might mean, and uh, to use a kind of method of um, of like. Uh, Ex experimental conceptualization. So in the work that I'm doing, I've used uh, basically the um, Amazonian um, theories on Amazonian shamanism by Eduardo Viveros de Castro and and that of uh, Roy Wagner, who was uh, recently died a few years ago about Melanesian societies in Papua New Guinea. And I was, uh, because I was sort of so uh, always aware that theories about India and about religiosity in India seem, are always seem very, stuck in India, so to speak. And, you know, there's been a kind of cessation of like, uh, of anthropology, which has tries to make broad claims and tries to think comparatively about what these things mean. And so basically what I came to was that, that even doing sadhana, which is, uh, which is, I always thought was a kind of mental technique. I realized that it was really just a, an ex internal version of, of puja, which is the main method of, of, um, 
relational uh, um, ceremony in Hinduism. As we all know, puja involves giving offerings of light and heat and incense, whatever, to deities. And I sort of came to be aware that um, that uh, that uh, sadhana was just an internal form of this, and that deities themselves, um, via the in in Advaita, the uh, Advaita Vedanta specifically says that that um de- that nothing exists but Brahman. You know, that's basically the, the Shankaracharya, Shankaracharya's thing. And I always was interested, how could that be? How could someone like my informant, how could he be worshipping this plethora of polytheistic spirits when he at the same time believes that none, none of them exist, <laughs> you know, and the only thing that exists is Brahman. And so what I kind of came to was that, was that, um, uh, you know, the, the sort of deity pantheons in traditions are kind of are ex- uh, examples of a kind of conceptualization themselves and that deities were a kind of perspective and uh, which relates to Viveros de Castro's concept of, of perspectivism in the Amazon, which is where like shamans in the Amazon see themselves through the lens of, a, of, a, of an animal or a plant or, a, or an enemy. And then, le- and then bring back knowledge to the community via that perspective. And it's a really complicated thing we can talk about later, but <laughs> I guess, but I sort of came to understand that, that the Indian tradition and sadhana was, was a kind of, just a different form of what you can see in other animist societies around the world where, where religious experts use perspectival ways of knowing in order to come into new forms of knowledge. And that's basically what uh, sadhana was. It's a, it's an internalized uh, form of self change, using a perspectival um, sort of perspectival knowledge uh, attainment. Um, and that and there's a sort of a, a relationship between between the different. The reason it seems so different to the West is something that Viveros de Castro talks about, and um, Philippe Descola, the idea that that Western modernity and knowledge has a kind of ulterior view to the Amazonian, which is that in the West, we think, um, we think that, um, you know, the, the earth is singular and that perception and human consciousness is a result of the physical world. But in the Amazon, like in India and in Samkhya ontology and in Advaita and, some, and you know, the Indian tradition, consciousness is seen as the causation and the physical world and everything around it is a result of consciousness. You know, it's a huge, it's a very central pillar of classical Indian thought. So I've sort of, my project is basically to compare these two um, and to try and make, basically try and make claims about what that means that we're seeing the same kind of thing. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry, Robert, to interrupt you, but we have very strict agenda and schedule. Yeah. Okay. And thank you so much for your presentation. We can discuss it in the, with the, you know, uh, at the end when we have like the 15 minutes but mm. um yeah thank you and i'm i'm sorry really to interrupt you can you just stop I'm sharing sorry. the screen <laughs> oh yeah, yeah okay sure. <laughs> that's thank great you so much. you're welcome you're welcome so uh, very uh, quickly our second speaker is lawa alonen and she is from uh, helsinki university right very good and so she's going to um, talk about narratives of yoga among the middle class practitioners in Bangalore. And I'm very much looking in to, to hear you because it's uh, something that I wanted to explore and to know more about. So please, uh, Lawa, share your, your screen. Mm. Yeah. yeah. I'm trying. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Something happened. Do you have the PowerPoint on your desktop? Um, let me see. Go. Don't worry, we're fine. Um, yeah, yeah. Sometimes it's just easier if you have already opened the yeah. PowerPoint on the desktop. No, there we yes, go. exactly. There we go. Super. Okay, I disappear. Okay, so <clears throat> first of all, thank you for this opportunity to take part in this conference. Tonight I will present some findings from my master's thesis on narratives and knowledge on yoga. This is the structure of the presentation. 
When I started this project, Alter, de Michelis and Strauss had published their works in 2004 and 2005. At the time, yoga scholarship was mostly historical or textual and there was a void for ethnographic studies. From the viewpoint of yoga as a lived practice, I wanted to observe the social reality of yoga in India, which I missed in the existing literature. My idea was to explore the reproduction and circulation of the ancient tradition in a modern non-ascetic context, and I wanted to understand the interplay and the of theory and practice. These questions were inspired by the discussions on the authenticity of the time. For example, Jakobsen regarded physical yoga as fitness yoga. By now, yoga scholarship has expanded. In a recent article, the Vilkwa demonstrates that there has been a significant rise in using ethnography to gather data and provides an outline of such studies. Yet, she notes that attention to non-international scenarios in India remains scarce. Furthermore, if there is paucity of ethnographic work among average ascetics, which motivated her work, my claim is that the average non-ascetic Indian yoga practitioners are not sufficiently included as informants either. I did four months of field work in Bangalore at the turn of 2005 and 2006 and gathered data by participant observation in two separate disciplines, Ayanga Yoga and the Swami Vivekananda, Vivekananda Yoga Anunsanthana Samstana S. Yasa. My fieldwork included daily yoga classes, satsangs, lectures, and various events whenever available, interviews, a small questionnaire, and most of all, innumerable conversations with various people in various contexts. I also attended an international yoga conference at the Eskyasa Yoga University. The informants were middle and upper middle class Hindus, and most of them were Brahmins. I interacted both with women and men and women, students and teachers, and with non-practitioners. In these contexts, it was possible to de detect differences, but also similarities between yoga practice in and outside India to understand what is specific to the Indian context. After handling the data, I had to pause the project due to various reasons. Finally, I wrote the thesis last year. A third a theoretical shift from tra tradition to knowledge started to develop in the field. Already before reaching Bangalore, my many inquiries were contested by an Ayurvedic doctor. He declared that in Europe, everyone takes knowledge as their basic right. But in India, it is not the same. Knowledge does not belong to everyone. Here it should be noted that as a young, white female beginner in yoga, I often seem to evoke a stereotypical image of yoga in the West. A common perception was that the Westerners traveled to India to take a quick course to become teachers. Simultaneously, teachers who had properly worked with Westerners knew that there are also dedicated practitioners. In contemporary Bangalore, yoga was regarded to be open for all. What happened? Just click on the desk and it will start again. Yes. Okay. The Ayurvedic doctor revealed two central recurring themes, conceptions of traditional yoga and the critique of contemporary yoga practice. He reminded that yoga used to be a secretive subject, learned only with a guru, and emphasized that one has to be accepted as a student to be taught. One had to commit to lifelong studies of the holistic traditions like yoga or Ayurveda, which had developed over thousands of years instead of picking and choosing according to your preference. He warned that unless you follow the whole system of yoga in its entirety, including diet, cleansing and breathing techniques, meditation, moral teachings of yama and niyama, the practice of asanas as fitness exercise can harm you. He explained that if you live in an ascetic tradition, you learn everything from your guru, but if you don't, then you should study the scriptures. Throughout my fieldwork, the textual tradition proved to be fundamental, unlike in the ascetic orders the Vilkwa has studied. The notion that most people practice yoga only for health and fitness came constantly up in conversations. According to him, I should have gone to an ashram, ashram instead of Bangalore, where teachers were not good and yoga was commercial. However, all these viewpoints were also contested, and some regarded them as a sign of being backwards. For example, a retired scholar who had worked in the Lonovel Institute had a very down-to-earth approach. He ridiculed the romantized and mystical notions of yoga and instead warned, warned against taking the scriptures literally. The fieldwork material 
posed questions parallel to the theoretical approach by Lambeck on knowledge and practice. Central questions to studying yoga as a system of knowledge are how knowledge is acquired, legitimated, and applied, the interplay of theory and practice, how the practitioners of each discipline interpret or evaluate the others. Crucial is that having and acquiring knowledge is very close to performing it, which in return is evaluated by others. Drawing from Lambeck, the textual tradition of yoga can be observed as objectified knowledge, which can be circulated, accumulated, manipulated, and applied in multiple ways. And the practice of yoga as embodied knowledge. I place the descriptions of practice unless performed under the category of objectified knowledge. Yet essentially they are interlinked. Practices and performances are often codified and encoded ideas and concepts need to be performed to be to have in implications. Textual knowledge is embodied in speech acts, performances, and narratives. Texts can also be looked up to be applied, used for bodily processes instead of recitation. Moreover, knowledge becomes part of the self. All this applies well to the theory and practice of yoga. Having quite a different approach from Alter's analysis on performativity, I view yoga classes as knowledge performances. Moreover, as a co-performance, both the teacher and the students evaluate and influence the performance of one another. In the end, it is the practitioner that forms the meaning of the performance according to one's competence. Lambeck suggests that we have to analyze the specific dialectic between embodiment and objectification. And I look forward to reading such an analysis of the classroom context. I have to skip this one, but anyway, there is an uh, unspoken ranking also in the yoga classroom contexts. Moving on to the narratives. <clears throat> I mentioned earlier the two central themes of my fieldwork data the conceptions of traditional yoga and the critique of contemporary practice. Their social dynamics reveal how the process of acquisition and performing knowledge is evaluated against the established authoritative knowledge. Narratives are performances of knowledge which demonstrate the competence and the status of the knowledge holder. Certain types of narratives were so frequent that I regard them as textbook narratives. These narratives seem to be legitim legitimate and occurred also as mini performances in various informal and formal contexts. Narratives of history, the grand narratives and scriptural references are distinct types of narratives, but I regard both of them fundamentally as a communicative strategy of referring to the authoritative past in the present or as the authoritative truth. To understand yoga in India, the importance of scriptures simply cannot be underestimated. Gurus and scriptures are the authorities. As a side note, I recommend an article by Parry on Shastric knowledge. Additionally, disciplines produce certain language and discourse, which are then reproduced as individuals internal internalize it. Indians love their stories. Legends of gods, gurus, and sages are often narrated, utilizing the intertextual library of canonical texts for discussing matters and describing wonders of yoga. Narratives about extraordinary gurus are also common. The personal narratives were often testimonies. I had a problem and yoga helped me, or yoga cured my health problem, and that is why I became a teacher. These narratives of the empowering and balancing embodied effects of yoga are used to motivate further interest in the subject. On the critical side, one central theme was the reductionist approach to yoga. Some of the narratives included the following comments. Without awareness, it is not yoga. Yoga is taught without addressing mind, without mental practice, physical teaching is only fitness. What is yoga? It has been taken as a small proportion like headstand and say that it is yoga. Ignorance. Yoga is only fitness and health, but they will learn the truth through the practice if they continue practicing. Yoga cannot be achieved quickly. 
Yoga is not an intellectual subject. One has to practice it to understand it. However, when I started to discuss the differences between different yogas, quickly the response was that all yoga is yoga. Or if I refer to physical yoga or modern yoga, I was told that there is no such thing as physical yoga or modern yoga. There is just yoga. Here the essential, essential ideas of yoga being an eternal subject and the lack of body-mind dualism in Indian thought came into play. Moreover, by evaluating the knowledge performance of others, the informants were performing their own competence. They knew yoga as a holistic tradition, but when confronted, confronted with the critical views they presented, they reverted to the legitimate narrative of tradition. Devoted teachers and practitioners also expert, expressed frustration and concern with the general lack of commitment to practice, lowering the quality of yoga. Especially, especially quick teacher training courses were regarded very critically. Some defended them, some abhorred them as selling yoga as a community to be consumed. Another aspect is the genuine concern of beginners claiming to be experts. Due to commercialization, yoga has become a business and a profession, which may lead in losing the essence, the quality of practice. So I will not read everything, it's just the bolded ones. Here in India, we don't have any teacher certification course. I know Guruji and Guruji knows me, so that's the way. I'm against the culture called teacher's training. It can't happen in yoga. Another aspect closely related to it that teaching has become a profession. So that's the main thing now. So I like that. Oh, so he makes a comparison to professionally of the priests. So I like that even yoga teachers certain time may become very professional. We may not even have time to practice. So that that have become a profession and then you lose the quality of practice, quality of teaching. Related to commercialization and consumerism was of course the bigger theme of cultural appropriation. <clears throat> to end on a more positive note and to consider how does one guru support the knowledge acquisition of his students. Um, this piece of a longer interview with a revered guru, guru depicts yoga as a process. To paraphrase it, so again, I'm not going to read it. He acknowledges the facts. People come to yoga for fitness and health reasons. The ultimate goal of self-realization is too abstract to even consider. So one has to start with something that is attainable to learn through one's own physical body. Regarded as a process, started, starting with the building, the embodied knowledge is not a problem. It is the starting point. It is also in the interest of the teacher to slowly be build on the objectified knowledge, also in order to be able to perform to his competence. As a teacher, he levels with the students, regardless of the initial motivations of the students and the genuine attempt to reach a variety of people inspires him. Later in the interview, he discussed this discusses how both objectified and embodied knowledge has to be acquired and it requires a lot of studies. It demonstrates how one supports the knowledge acquisition. In his classes, as in these interviews, he feeds spoonfuls of objectified knowledge to the students. Learning yoga is a process. Matters are discussed through the objectified textual knowledge and it is also embedded in the embodied practice over time. I'm sorry about this very long, long um, piece of interview. So maybe you have time to read it through the YouTube if you go there. So to end, I argue that we still need more ethnographies of yoga to understand better how meanings are negotiated and to understand the interplay of embodied and objectified knowledge of yoga. I'm especially looking forward to reading studies which include the variety of different kinds of Indian yoga practitioners as informants and interlocutors 
and those that explore the multifaceted forms of yoga in contemporary India, revealing the complexities of the social reality of yoga. And I realized that, of course, maybe this presentation presented my material in a very um, simplified way, but just as a quick note, the situation is really quite much more complex. So I'm really looking forward to more ethnographic studies. Thank you. If there are any questions, and um, happy to have them, and also comments. And I, ho I hope to be respectful to the Indian audience. And although I didn't really present the literature that much, here is some of the background. Of course, I have read more, but just for this presentation. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much, um, Luha. Lahua, because it, it was very interesting indeed, and I really hope, I mean, I really would like to to read your uh, master thesis indeed, because it, 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 it was just a short 15 minutes, I mean, you were very much on time, eh? so very good job, and really, really, um, I really would like, because it, it, it can give a lot of information, even for me, because I, this is a, a part of um, ethnography that uh, I lack of, I, I miss this part, so it would be very interesting. Okay, so now Thank just to stop sharing the screen and uh, of course the question will be at the end. So after we have our last uh, speaker that she's already ready, Bridget Ball and uh, oh you you are going to start your PhD with Amanda Lucia. Oh fantastic. Say hello to her by my side. And she's going to uh, present a paper on who's afraid of the menstruating body, reflection on menstrual taboo and yoga. So the floor is yours. Wonderful. Okay. Nope, that didn't work. Let's try that. Okay, awesome. Um, hi, everybody. Thank you so much, Theo and Daniela um, and Soaz for having me. Um, and Laoha and Robert, those were such amazing presentations. I am excited to read your, you know, theses and books someday. Um, so yeah, my name is Bridget Bull. I just got my master's at the University of Chicago and I'll be starting my PhD in the fall. Um, so this research is kind of the very beginning. It's like pre-ethnographic. You'll see as I get into the paper um, what I'm working with here, but it really is about the phenomenon of people practicing menstrual taboo um, in the yoga studio. So I'll get started. Um, in the back of a crowded yoga studio, a practitioner goes into child's pose while the rest of the class enters headstand. The sole practitioner in child's pose is not an odd sight, right? Perhaps they're new to the practice, feeling under the weather. Perhaps, however, it's that time of the month. In the yoga studio, menstruation marks a temporal and material reality. For certain practitioners, menstruation denotes two to three days of complete cessation from asana practice. And for others, it simply means avoiding inversions. The menstruating body is a conceptual and practical problem in yoga spaces because of yoga's foundational patriarchal location. From its textual sources to its founders, yoga is a practice primarily designed for the male body. Now, I wanna take a moment at the beginning of this presentation to just preface with a few notes about location, methodology, and gender. So while menstrual taboos infiltrate yoga studios the world over, I'm specifically, I'm specifically interested in thinking about Euro-American yoga practitioners, primarily white, who participate in a menstrual taboo that was constructed in a culture not their own, one that they've chosen to adopt. And this brings me to the question of methodology, right? So while my research is prompted by my own observations of this phenomenon in um, yoga studios in the United States, um, I've yet to do formal ethnographic work. So this presentation is rooted really in possible textual histories of the taboo and a real theoretical investigation of what menstrual taboo is kind of writ large. And finally, a note on gender and its troubles. Uh, menstruation can't disentangle itself from gender. And while menstruating bodies don't inherently belong to cisgender women, I often talk about them as such, particularly because notions of taboo regarding female sexuality play a large role in thinking about menstruation and yoga. 
So considering this, I've chosen where possible to denote these bodies as menstruating bodies. Uh, you'll hear those two words a lot in the next 15 minutes, um, rather than using female or woman, though these terms do come up throughout my argument. So Mary Douglas writes that ambiguous things can seem very threatening. Taboo confronts the ambiguous and shunts it into the category of the sacred. Taboo in its foundation is, according to Douglas, a reaction to ambiguity. Menstruation is inherently ambiguous in the yoga space. This ambiguity is rooted in yoga's patriarchal underpinnings and necessitates the modern menstruating yoga practitioner to grapple with the ambiguity of their own materiality within a patriarchal structure. Taboo in turn offers a response to this ambiguity, marking out menstruation as sacred. I'll get into this later. Uh, in reading against the grain of a tradition and corpus of foundational yoga and yoga adjacent texts that are originally imagined for male bodies and thinking with scholars of taboo and its ritual and sacred life, I hope to illuminate ways in which the menstruating body navigates patriarchy in yoga spaces. So to contextualize and examine menstrual taboo, I'm gonna offer a reading of Ayurvedic textual sources that practitioners may use as a means of locating the menstruating body. Uh, and then I turn to taboo, specifically the tools of religious studies, which is my field, um, to think differently about taboo and why particularly regarding yoga, taboo is utilized as a space of meaning making for the Euro-American practitioner. And ultimately what I argue is that menstrual taboo becomes a site of sacrality and recuperation for the modern menstruating yoga practitioner. So searching for source, textual locations. Most yoga practitioners will turn to patriarchal textual sources as a means of studying the, the tradition, right? So most of you probably have read them or come in contact with them. I'm talking about something like Patanjali's Yoga Sutras or even Iyengar's Light on Yoga. But a problem persists across these classical and modern sources, right? The source material of yoga offers little insight into menstruating bodies. What explanatory frameworks can these yoga practitioners turn to? While there are a few available primary textual sources on yoga and menstruation, I found that Ayurvedic literature provides well-trodden textual terrain to explore yoga's inherent issues with control over menstruating bodies. So for the Euro-American yoga practitioner, a lot of you might be familiar with this, Ayurveda and its literature are presented mainly in terms of one's constitution, right? And offer lifestyle adjustments like food, sleep timing, other holistic approaches to health. But for the menstruating body, Ayurveda offers a compelling intervention. Over and above women's overall health, the primary objective of Ayurvedic literature with regard to women is entirely focused on the body's reproductive potential. Reflected in Ayurvedic literature is a keen and undeniable concern about fertility and the stabilization of the reproductive system. So while a complete an overview of all Ayurvedic literature is beyond the scope of these 15 minutes, um, I'm gonna offer some ways in which the literature hints at this inherent connection between reproduction and menstruation. So in Sushruta's compendium, menstruation is treated in a few different ways, but most notably, as you can read here, it's treated as an end product parallel to semen. The various authors of Ayurvedic texts had a clear understanding of menstrual blood, not just as blood, but a substance that's connected to the reproductive system in a very integral way. And more than just connecting the two, these texts offer a space to think about temporal restrictions surrounding menstruation as a means of protecting the fertile or menstruating body. Furthermore, Ayurvedic literature offers a textual connection between resting time and menstruation. There we go. Um, so Julia Leslie, who is an Ayurvedic scholar and talks a lot about menstruation, cites the Sushra Samhita, writing that all the medical texts agree that the first three days of menstrual flow are unsuitable for conception. For them, the semen is like an object cast into flowing water and swept away by the stream. This idea of rest from sexual activity or otherwise marks menstruation, specifically the first three days of menstruation as a particularly potent moment for the menstruating body. 
Taken differently, those first days temporally mark when the menstruating body is at its most potent, right? So in looking at the practice of menstrual taboo and yoga, there's a clear parallel here between the Ayurvedic literature and cessation of practice. Many yoga practitioners, as I said earlier, will cease doing inversions or practicing altogether for the first few days of one cycle. And there's no clear source as to where this rule comes from, but this Ayurvedic literature offers something as a offers something of a clue. So in marking menstrual blood as inherently connected to reproduction, Ayurvedic literature marks it also as sacred or something to be protected. And this is how I kind of get into the more theoretical side and think about taboo. Um, so persisting in patriarchy, taboo. I've outlined the space of yoga adjacent Ayurvedic text in which the Euro-American yoga practitioner could turn to locate the menstruating body. I've also established that these Ayurvedic texts, while offering some space for the menstruating body, are still patriarchally entrenched, right? So thinking with a scholar like Judith Butler, we can understand that while women and those in menstruating bodies live within and under patriarchal hegemony, they're still able to carve out autonomous spaces of being. So I posit that taboo is a means by which the menstruating body is able to locate itself in this hegemony, particularly the patriarchal hegemony of yoga, and establishes autonomous space within its boundaries. So the menstruating yogi embodies a temporality otherwise unaccounted for, right? A temporal space that certain bodies do not and cannot possess. This temporality inherently sets this body aside as other. Taboo then not only accounts for this difference, but marks it as distinct, material, and sacred. In marking out the sacrality of the menstruating body, Menstrual taboo creates space for the menstruating body in the broader yoga imaginary, and indeed a different kind of embodied femininity. Taboo as sacred is not some novel position, right? I look to scholars like Mary Douglas, who in her work on taboo, establishes theoretical grounding about how taboo works as a sacred signifier, setting aside aspects of society as other without inherently discounting them. Douglas takes taboo into account as quite integral to the function of a given society. She deals not with the demarcation of something as taboo and its inherent sacrality, but with the concept of contagion and how the sacred requires maintenance because of its potential disruption. Right? And this line of thinking is parallel to the menstrual taboo in yoga. As you can see in the Ayurvedic literature, the menstruating body is cordoned off not because of its danger, but because of its potential power. If the menstruating body is taken as such, women are not just opting into a structure of patriarchy, but a structure of power when they choose to cease practice. One that marks them as materially and temporally dangerous and therefore powerful. This temporality of the menstruating body that I've laid out is imperative to the reality of menstrual taboo in yoga. The temporary nature of menstruation, and historically speaking, the religio-cultural schema of South Asia, accepts menstruation and reproductive functions as a temporary state of pollution. But I argue that in the particular case of the yogic menstrual taboo, the body is, in a sense, eternally taboo. Its temporality is precisely what marks out its taboo status across time. The capacity for a body to exist within the taboo sets it aside as always at the threshold of taboo and therefore always under its auspices. Any menstruating body in a yoga space exists always with the potentiality of taboo, thereby setting it aside as sacred. All right, so some concluding thoughts. All yoga practitioners, but particularly menstruating yoga practitioners must find a way to contend with their material reality. As menstruating bodies flood yoga spaces, particularly in the Euro-American context, practitioners must grapple with the historical reception of said bodies. Yoga's patriarchal foundation, therefore, makes, sorry, I'm making sure this is good, uh, makes menstruation a particularly potent force. Uh, in Buckley's Blood Magic, with, which is uh, this wonderful ethnographic collection on menstrual taboo, the authors write, the menstrual taboo as such does not exist. 
many menstrual taboos, rather than protecting society from a universally ascribed feminine evil, explicitly protect the perceived cultural spirituality of monstrous women from the influence of others in a more neutral state, as well as protecting the latter in turn from the potent positive spiritual force ascribed to such women. This notion of protection is indicative of menstruation's potency, right? If something must be protected, it's inherently powerful. From the textual basis of Ayurvedic literature to the taboo Euro-American women establish themselves in, menstruation, something demarcated as requiring protection, becomes a means of negotiating patriarchy. Menstruating bodies in the yoga space find ways to participate in a patriarchal system that fundamentally doesn't include them. Many practitioners turn to the likes of Ayurveda as a means of explicating and locating the menstruating body. Even there, though, one contends with a patriarchal need for protecting the fertility inherent to menstruation. It turns out there is no outside of patriarchy. As Judith Butler remarked, there is a question of how to work the trap that one is inevitably in. The yogic menstrual taboo is just that, a means of navigating the patriarchal traps of yoga. The taboo historically has demarcated space as inherently sacred and temporally and materially creative. In choosing to participate in taboo, menstruating bodies claim power and are able to locate themselves not within the scope of yoga lineage, but instead on its illustrious outskirts. Ultimately, menstrual taboo allows Euro-American yoga practitioners not a way out of patriarchy, but a way to work within its trappings by creating an augmenting, augmenting space for menstruation in the Euro-American cultural landscape. Thank you. Thank you so much, Bridget. You were perfectly on time. Yeah. Another fascinating presentation. And I used the, wo the word fascinating. I didn't want to use it because it's like, you know, everyone is using fascinating. But oh, fantastic. See, also Ruth Westboy just wrote fascinating research, Bridget. So let's start perhaps with the uh, questions because, okay, we have 15, 20 minutes perhaps. So it's enough time. So let's see. Uh, I should go with the one uh, which has more thumbs up, right? Something like that, Theo? You can, but you're also allowed to pick ones that you want answered. Oh, um, <laughs> Chair's privilege. <laughs> Chair's privilege. <laughs> Very good. Yeah, yeah. Then it's the first one, because this is the question I wanted to ask uh, Lawa. So um, are you there, Lawa? Do you? Yes, she's there. So, Lawa, do you have a sense of how recent efforts to professionalize the teaching of yoga in India is affecting the status of traditional teaching practices? That is a very uh, fascinating question. <laughs> Again, the fascinating comes. Yeah, no, I would that... like to make a clarification question whether the person is meaning uh, um, teaching in general or the teacher trainings mm. but whatever actually that um, clarification would be I must say that um, I presented uh, data that I gathered almost 15 years ago so as such my um, role has shifted from a scholar researcher to a practitioner so, of course, I wrote my thesis and I'm a little bit considering whether I should study, uh, continue my studies postgraduate, but um, I haven't done research recently. So I'm not sure if I can answer this question, but if it is about the teacher trainings in our system, I'm an Ayanga yogi myself, uh, they have actually flipped around though. So, because TDCs became so fashionable, mm -hmm. they are stopping the whole TDC systems worldwide and going to mentoring. And as a practitioner, my sense is that mentoring will be the next trend in teacher training. I but see. I have not done research on that. But are you in touch with like, I don't know, other practitioners or other people you, you met at that time? No, unfortunately I am not so. Uh, mm. 
I found that uh, keeping in contact with Indian <laughs> people is something that I was not able to maybe keep up with. So, okay. Yeah. Okay, but but uh, yeah, think about it because I think it would be a great uh, a, a great continuation of your studies. You know, continuing a research, doing a research after fifteen years after like such a boom in yoga, even in India, with the International Yoga Day and all these changes that happened. I think it would be very useful, and uh, you seconding. have an entire <laughs> seconding that one. Yes, yeah, I think that would be fascinating to go back but it's precisely as Daniela's kept saying because of the gap the gap mm. if you if you go back and if you're able to do more research that gap actually becomes really interesting then because you are able to do how, how have things changed yeah um, yeah and, and these are like very important years so please do that research <laughs> in your spare time <laughs> yeah of course of course of course we don't want to push you but if you find some time please do that <laughs> okay 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 we have the uh, ruth do you want to ask the question where is ruth ruth uh west toby where is ruth it's not here anymore hi, hi, hi. there she is <laughs> oh sorry i'm i'm desperately multitasking <laughs> <And that laughs> fascinating paper thank you so much but it was fascinating and I know that's such a terrible word but it was so um, I've been looking at the yogic body and gender within the yogic body so I was looking at rajas as part of that so female sexual or menstrual fluid um, and, and what I'm not trying to do in my research is make a connection between the pre-modern and the modern which is what you're trying to do so I'd be really interested in your views on how you make those connections like to what extent does global modern yoga um, source back to Ayurveda or to the yoga texts at all because to my mind there is quite a separation there so I, I suppose it's around how you make that connection and what that reception history is of those pre-modern Indian sources like Shushruta to what's happening in American yoga studios is really different and I'd really like to be in touch with you and perhaps we could share resources because I love some of the references that you included in your work so thank you. Yeah thank you no I kind of had the same question while I was writing and I think what it comes down to and I think a lot of it will be made clear when you know we can be in yoga studios again and I can do some ethnographic work but I think it's a question of authenticity and where people look to find a, like a way to legitimate things that they're already doing and so I don't know that they are actually legitimately connected as much as you can look back and say, oh, well, look at these Ayurvedic texts. They're suggesting that in the first three to four days, you rest if you're on your period or you cease sexual activity or whatever it is. Is that a possible, is that where this comes from? Because it is kind of mysterious. I'm sure a lot of people have heard whisperings about, oh, what to do, on, if, what to do in terms of practice on your period. Um, but there's not a lot of literature as to like where that comes from, or if it just comes from nowhere, if it comes from a random guru who is like, yeah, don't do that. Um, so I think it's more like a thought experiment. Um, and I think it probably, in my mind, I would be very interested to talk to like practitioners who practice menstrual taboo and figure out why and where it's coming from. Um, but yeah, I think the question of authenticity and, um, yeah, I think there's another word for it, but it's not coming to me. Anyway, that would be my my guess. Okay, uh, but uh, just to remain in uh, on this topic, uh, Bridget, I, I was just wondering, maybe it, it is very stupid questions because you were just you are saying like uh, how to use this uh, taboo, the menstrual taboo, no? But uh, from the perspective of the practitioner. Like if you are a menstruating body, do you really feel to be dangerous and powerful? I mean, maybe this will be like, you know, the, the side of the ethnographic side that you have to, to do, but it's like, how can we really relate a theory, like this theory of being powerful and dangerous with the reality of that, you know, sometimes menstruating body are uh, 
training body, they are suffering. That is why they prefer not to do some practices. So I think it's a, maybe it's important even to create a kind of distinction among the menstruating body, even among the, the bodies of women who decide not to menstruate, perhaps. So it's like, you know, I think uh, maybe this can be a you know, helpful suggestion for when you are doing the ethnographic research, just to, to, to create like uh, different ideas of menstruating body. Perhaps, yeah, I don't know. I think, no, I think it's interesting. And I think one of the reasons I gravitated towards taboo and thinking about theories of taboo and danger and power and stuff like that is because when I've witnessed teachers, teacher trainings, people say, oh, you shouldn't practice the first few days of your period. It's usually in my experience, and this is what I mean, where it's like, I don't have the ethnographic raw data, but I've heard many people be, it's not about, oh, you're in pain. It's like, you don't want to mess up your prana or like different things are cited, but it's often, I think, kind of cordoned off to this female power, feminine energy. Um, yeah, so I don't know, it's an interesting question. Yeah, yeah, but I mean, I think, I mean, I don't remember, uh, I, I, I attended another presentation and she was discussing the fact that, uh, especially in uh, younger yoga, the menstruating body are put aside. And so some women were feeling like, uh, you know, a bit uncomfortable for the fact that they being menstruating body was like highlighted and everybody could know that. So it's like, you know, even it can be a, a powerful feeling, but at the same time it's like, uh, you know, um, I mean, le just a few thoughts for you to, to thinking when you... Can I throw in yeah. some data from the European context? Um, Please. Uh, I think those stories are actually, in, in, in my data, those stories were linked. It, it's not something I spent a lot of time looking at in my thesis, but those stories were linked where it was often women who had been in workshops where they'd been, they'd felt excluded for menstruating bodies and, oh, you know, you're, you're, you're weak, you need to lie down, you need to do this, you need to do that. It was, it was often those women who then, uh, develop these stories of I am you know I, I I'm still not doing these practices but I'm doing them because I'm powerful rather than I'm doing them because you know I'm a weak woman kind of thing and it was like the the, the choice not to practice hadn't changed but the reasons behind it had um, and that's something I saw a lot I just wanted to point that in just in case you find the same thing uh, in your field work as a pointer Yeah, and uh, I mean, there are a lot of questions for you, uh, Bridget, like, for example, just to remain a bit on this topic, uh, uh, an anonymous is saying, like, have you considered referring to the field of female yoga, including Gita Yenger literature that relates uh, to menstruation? <laughs> Suffocating. I repeat, I'm sorry, Incl the, the literature um, uh, on uh, menstruation by Gita Yenger. I haven't read a ton of her, so I need to. Thank you. I will. Oh, super. Um, let me see. Uh, uh, uh. Okay, let's let's go to. Uh, where is it? Oh, sorry, I'm very bad with this slide. Though. Um, so, so one question for Robert. Robert, uh, an anonymous, I did not understand perhaps because of the time limitation, what exactly is the novelty concerning sadhana? Yeah, I saw that question. I'm, I'm not sure what they mean by novelty. Yeah, I didn't use that word. So, okay. Yeah. So anonymous, if you want to appear and tell us what was your meaning, or maybe you can ask another question and give us more information. Yeah, but but uh, a question for you from me, Robert, because I mean you uh, uh, you you were talking about a specific sadhana, right? Because there are several ideas of sadhana, several ways of practicing sadhana, and uh, so I, I was wondering if you were referring to the specific sadhana of your guru, or if you want to use this kind of understanding in a more broad way. Yeah, well, I guess that's uh, like Tagore said that sadhana was just the one's life work, right? It's a very broad terms, but generally mm. when 
people use the word sadhana, they mean japa sadhana, they mean mantra sadhana, you know, so that's kind of what I was talking about, yeah. Yeah, but I mean, it depends uh, what kind of people you're talking about. No, I mean, it's not that all True. the people, uh, no, yeah, it is just, uh, I mean, it can be useful just to specify that uh, you are referring to a certain kind of informants. So. I guess it's uh, the idea that um, uh, sadhana means, for, for the word sadhana means to, to accomplish something, right? That's yeah. the, the word sadhana means to, to accomplish something. And um, generally the understanding, not just with my informant, but you know, what seems to be across the board is that sadhana means uh, any activity which is accomplishing uh, profound psychological change, shall we, shall we say, you know? So, um, the idea that, uh, yeah, so that's kind of what I was talking about. And generally amongst the ascetic life, other than the, this, uh, you know, certain physical tapasyas, you know, like this, um, putting, <laughs> this mm -hmm. kind of thing, generally uh, sadhana is referred to as, as uh, mantra sadhana, as, you know, dhyan, basically. Mm -hmm. And as you, as you know very well, this idea about yoga and about the, the small percentage of sadhus that, that really practice postural yoga and, and most of the time, you know, this whole, this whole question, it's a big uh, topic in this context to talk about. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. But one yeah. thing that I, yeah, one thing I was really struck with, which is, a, again, it's an interesting thing. And I think it does have specific uh, contributions to the way that we think about modern yoga in the West or, or around the world is that in terms of sadhana, the idea of to accomplish something, uh, my informant and others have said they really they look at postural yoga and they say they they say it's not sadhana you know it's a preparation for sadhana you know I, I for me the equivalent of doing postural yoga and doing japa mantra sadhana is like the equivalent of of uh you know taking a warm bath before a, a dense uh, psychoanalysis session <laughs> something like this silly yeah that this kind of thing, yeah. So th this is a big conversation and as controversial mm. as well. Right? So because of course yoga is a modern phenomenon, a hundred years of change, and so yeah, you know, we don't yeah, it's time. it's a uh, yeah, it's big, very big uh, topic, a bit controversial. Even because I mean, uh, yoga itself is a tradition, and it was always evolving. Not even the concept of sadhana and. I mean, if you think about uh, Aghori and the idea of sadhana is completely different, maybe it's not connected with Japa. So, I mean, it's always important to contextualize this, the situation, the, the context where the sadhana is done. And even, I think also, I mean, because you were uh, using the ontological term, no? giving importance uh, to the uh, emic perspective, I think even, um, let's say, Western practitioners of yoga, they have their own perspective. So maybe it's also important to see what is a, a sadhana for a, a, a practitioner of postural yoga. Maybe this can be useful. I don't know. Their own interpretation. I mean, because, you know, everything is, uh, the pizza effect is going and coming back. And so it's just important to have an open mind and see all the different um, exchanges and changes. Okay. Okay, uh, what to do, Tio? Okay, we have more time, right? Uh, we can go. Uh, we can go a few minutes longer. Um, okay. Um, I mean, uh, there's there's a lot of different questions, and some of them we've kind of covered, and some of them may be more or less relevant. Um, I want to okay. kind of give you the chance to ask any questions. You you can ask any questions you want to as well. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I did. I did questions. more or less. I have already asked my questions more. Um, I'm just looking. I mean, because the, this, uh, there are many anonymous. Mm -hmm. um, you can help me in uh, choosing the one that you're more <laughs> curious about. I'm. Uh, I'm interested that we have two ones for uh, for for Bridget here on menstrual menstrual taboo. The one about um, uh, whether Bridget's seen the the scholarship of Christi, Kristen. Hansen on practices around menstrual blood amongst the bowels and also from which sources are westerners drawing their menstrual blood taboo from um, and uh, what about tantric reinterpretations and divine feminine discourses and I think they make two interesting questions together because apart from anything else they show just how wide this 
discourse can be right like like how how wide are you drawing your net because it's perfectly mm. acceptable to say this small i think yeah i mean that's what i was gonna say i'm like i you know the the more you kind of start to swim in these waters it gets a little overwhelming so i think primarily yeah i'm very concerned with why you know primarily why white women in the United States are participating in a menstrual taboo. Um, like that's my driving question. And in terms of tantric reinterpretation, I haven't read enough tantric scholarship at all. And I think that would be really interesting. It was something I was going to dive into and then, you know, it's 15 minutes. Um, and I haven't read Kristen Hansen's work. I've read some of Aggie Wittich, who is, I think, about to her dissertation is all about menstruation and Ashtanga, I believe. Um, anyway, so in terms of which sources Westerners are drawing from, this is kind of one of my main questions I'll have going into ethnographic work because I'm not sure. In my kind of non-official ethnography of yoga spaces, I don't know that there is a source other than a teacher saying, this is what the practice is. This is what you do. Um, and that's just kind of where it lies. And so if you're looking for a source, that's where I found Ayurveda to be really interesting because that does seem to give an answer as to why you would not practice on your period or when you're pregnant or whatever, whatever you're kind of ceasing practice for. Um, but yeah, in terms of where they're getting menstrual taboo from, I don't know. And that's kind of why I'm so interested in it. Yes, indeed. Uh, I mean, it, it, it would be very interesting to know the, the answer, actually, because it's, uh, uh, oh, God, I'm very, oh, the, 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 these questions keeps moving. Yeah, we have lots from Bridget, and they're all uh, quite detailed. Yeah. Um, and and uh, I, I, I want to remind people that if they have uh, further questions as well, you can reach out to any of our presenters and have email conversations. Part of this is about putting people in contact with each other. Um, wow. Yeah, I think I think uh, mostly we've covered a lot of this stuff. Um, apart from a couple of kind of comments and questions, we can we can kind of leave it there. Um, unless one of the things I have asked and I asked in the last session is uh, whether any of your the presenters had any questions for each other, because um, that can be a, a fun one. Um, yeah. could, that you don't, you know, you're so focused on your own talk. Is there anything that you wished you'd put on the Slido for each other? Um, feel free. Mm -hmm. Let's put you on the spot. Breathe. <laughs> <laughs> No question comes to mind, but I'm just so for Lauha going back and doing more research. <laughs> yeah. I really feel like it would be so fascinating to see what the differences are and mm. given the past 15 years in yoga and yoga scholarship. So definitely. Yeah, that's, that's true. All right. Yep. Do we, should we save it for the round table at this point? Hopefully you guys will be coming back on Friday night. Um, um, yeah, so um, do you have anything you need you need to say or you want to say, Daniela, to round up? Or any no, I have just to thank these three, three speakers because the, the context were very different, but they presented the, um, the, the, the papers in a very clear way. And uh, I mean, for, for many of you, it was the first time. So bravo, good work, good work. And uh, yeah, maybe we can discuss more during the, the round table. So we have more time to think about different uh, topics uh, and uh, open the floor without this tension of uh, presenting that is always there. Definitely, definitely fantastic. Yes, and yeah, thank you again. Another three fantastic papers. Uh, that is the last of our uh, of our presenters. Um, we've had uh, a lot going on over the last two weeks. Um, so yes, on Friday, what we're aiming to do um, is our chairs are going to do their best to kind of catch up on each other's panels as much as they can. In the meantime, I've been editing and uploading the videos as fast as, as, fast as possible. The editing isn't the problem, it's the uploading them to YouTube, um, so which takes hours. Um, so what we're gonna do on Friday is we're gonna come together and have a little discussion and there'll be time for participants to reflect 
reflect on um, kind of where they're at and, and um, not just about the conference itself, but also kind of the future of yoga studies, what it's like to do postgraduate research in yoga. I'm uh, and, and, and I think that I'm aware that a number of our audience are kind of interested and curious as much in the process as in the outputs of research. And that's one of the reasons we wanted to do this. So um, do come along with your kind of questions uh, for participants and for the for the, the panel chairs um, on that basis, kind of, you know, um, where we think yoga studies might be going, where are the interesting things happening, um, what's possible, what isn't, and what it's like to actually do this work. Um, often in quite a lot of isolation, which is why we get a bit excited mm -hmm. when we get to hang out.